Hello and welcome to a brand new season of the House of Wellness. Great to be back with you in 2024 and equally as exciting to be standing alongside the one and only Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Hello, oh, guys. Hi, Darcy. It is brilliant to be back after a very hectic time. We made it through Christmas <laughs> and now it's as though it never happened. I mean, time moves so fast. I agree and I can't believe that it's February already. I think we'll be breaking out the Easter eggs anytime soon. <laughs> Jack, can we stay in February just a little <laughs> Sorry. bit? Sorry. <laughs> because this month is Red Feb when we encourage everybody to focus on something that's important to all of us, and that's the heart. And when you think about it, Nick, it's probably something we should talk a whole lot more about, given the number of heart-related issues that are changing people's lives for the worse. Yeah, there's no doubt, Darcy, that the heart is actually one of our most important organs, and, and it pumps an incredible 97,000 kilometres of blood vessels every single day. And to give you some context, that's enough to go around the whole world twice. And is it true that a female's heart beats faster than a male's? Yeah, I'm afraid, yeah, I'm afraid so, Joe, <laughs> because actually your hearts are a little bit smaller, so they have to work a bit harder to push all that blood around. Well, that is really fascinating to me, Dr Nick, for sure. February is Red Feb, as you said, and we're encouraging everyone to go and get their heart checked. And today, the yellow wiggle, Greg Page, shares his own headline-making heart health issue as well as we catch up with a leading cardiologist who's going to share with us the right food to eat for better heart health. Heinz, he discovers that the path to true love is getting your hands dirty. It's matchmaking in the garden. I love this. <laughs> I love that. But you know what I love more? My trip to France and I visited the amazing town of La roche posay And I'll reveal why being backed up and bloated can have a bad effect on your heart. And you got caught up with leading cardiologist Dr Brett Forge on the House of Wellness a short time ago and he was sharing the importance of how we need to get heart checks regularly to keep ourselves healthy and safe. Yeah, it's certainly true, Darcy. Everyone over 40 should have a regular heart check because we know that simple changes can really reduce risk. Well, one well-known Australian who had his own big scare is Wiggle's Greg Page. Four years ago, the yellow Wiggle suffered a heart attack after performing on stage in Sydney. That's right. So he was reunited with the rest of the Wiggles on stage, as you say, and he was so lucky they were performing at a bushfire relief concert that there was a nurse in the crowd who performed CPR, and thankfully he's OK. But he's now urging everybody to listen and check in on their heart. Hi everybody, we're, we're the Wiggles. Toot toot, chugga chugga, big red car. Potato, hot potato. Hot potato, hot potato. Greg, I know that the Wiggles have always been about the children, but as a mother, I need to tell you and say thank you for the respite that you provided for parents around the world. <laughs> you put some Wiggles on, put the music on, video, whatever, dancing in the lounge room. It was such a gift. But you started out doing kindergartens and kids' birthday, <laughs> birthday parties. Is yeah. this true? It is true. Yeah, that's how we started. I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny when you think back and reflect on how it began. We used to charge, say, $500 for the Wiggles to play for you. So somebody booked us, but they sold tickets to that show. <laughs> and they sold, like, 500 tickets at $5 a head. <laughs> and we thought, well, hang on, why are we charging $500? That's when we realised that people are paying to come and see us. So that was really a pinch-me moment where we thought, hang on, this could be something bigger than we ever thought it could be. And now, of course, so many generations of kids have grown up and you do these adult gigs. How amazing. It is. It's incredible. We're very fortunate that as old, older gentlemen, <laughs> we're able to still get on stage and perform for the people that grew up watching us. And it's such a trip down memory lane for them, but also for us too. And we have such a good time on stage, the four of us. It brings back a lot of good memories. We need your help to sing it because we don't have... We can just go home. They know it. The Wiggles reunion shows are a nostalgia fueled delight for Greg Page and his now grown up fan base. But it was at one of these concerts four years ago that the original Yellow Wiggle came frighteningly close to losing his life. You know, it was a hot night and, you know, the heat's not conducive when you're exerting yourself on stage. And there'd been times in the past when, because it is such a physically demanding show, that I would kind of collapse at the side of the stage and nothing would be too wrong, but this time it was different. There was something majorly wrong. Thank you, everybody! Woo! So what had happened was I suffered a heart attack, which is different to a cardiac arrest. But the heart attack was so severe that it sent my heart into cardiac arrest. Um, guys, we, I think we're going to end it there. Greg's not feeling real well. He's... Um... I think he's going to be OK, but um, uh, he's not feeling real well, so I don't think we can go on with another song. 
someone who's having a heart attack, their heart is still beating, it's still pumping blood around their body, right? But for cardiac arrest, there's no blood pumping around your body. You are effectively clinically dead. But there's a window of time in which that person can be resuscitated if bystanders know what to do. When you realised how close you had come to not surviving, how did that make you feel? Um, that's an interesting question because actually I, sometimes I, I think I don't really acknowledge that, how close I came. Um, yeah, I don't really reflect on that too much, to be honest. I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate that when it happened, it was so quick. Like, I literally blacked out within seconds. For a lot of people that have a heart attack that leads to a cardiac arrest, they have that moment of thinking, oh, my gosh, what's happening? I never had that. It just happened so quickly that it was over. To wake up in hospital and be told that you've survived, you're not really sure what you survived, to be honest. Do you know that you might not have survived if it hadn't been for other people that were able to save your life? But, yeah, because I wasn't aware of what was happening at the time, I think it's something that's kind of almost beyond my comprehension. While it's difficult for Greg to process the full scale of what he went through, not a day goes by where he doesn't think about the four bystanders who came to his aid backstage. After surviving, I realised I knew very little about this, even though my wife's a cardiac nurse, right? <laughs> so I thought, well, why is that? And I realised that cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac arrest is one of the biggest killers in our country. It's a critical national health issue, but it's one that flies under the radar. It's not spoken about. We talk about heart disease and looking after our heart, but we don't talk about what everyday people can do if somebody collapses in front of them, either at work or at home, at the shops, at the park. I think a lot of people like myself, I thought you had to be trained in order to do CPR, whereas now I know you don't. Any attempt at resuscitation is better than no attempt. You don't have to be trained or qualified. So knowing that, helps people get beyond that freeze point of, well, I shouldn't do anything. Hands on the chest and we start to compress. Keep the beat, keep the beat going. Greg's close call inspired him to start up Heart of the Nation, a charity dedicated to improving Aussie's awareness of how to respond to cardiac arrests. And he's particularly passionate about one vital piece of technology. So this is the little machine that saved your life? Yep. This is an AED, Automated External Defibrillator. No matter what brand or model it is, they all work in pretty much the same way. So if it's not talking to you, work out how to get it talking to you. Either turn it on using a power button or some of them have a lid that you open up. So you just press the power button or open it up, get it talking, and it tells you what to do. It becomes the team leader. So there was one of those at the venue? Yeah, it was available for my responders. So the fact that they were able to call triple zero, start CPR and have access rapidly to an AED, they're the three kind of links in what we call the chain of survival that saved my life. Just call for help, start CPR and use an AED. So you would like to see an AED readily accessible wherever we are in the community? I'd love to see What that. does that look like? Well, what it looks like is one in every building, one on every floor of a building, because if you have one of these within three minutes of somebody, so from collapse to being shocked with an AED within three to five minutes can result in survival rates as high as 60 to 70%. Right, we're not talking 10%. So rapid access in public buildings, in residences, in streets, they need to be everywhere. So does that come down to funding? I mean, how expensive are they? Look, they're not that expensive in the scheme of things. They're a couple of thousand dollars, right? Between two and three thousand dollars. But when they save a life, that's immeasurable. So they are extremely valuable. Having them close by means that more people will survive. So what I'd love to see happen is that the government actually says, we will help fund this because every life that is lost costs the economy. And I hate to put it in economic terms, but unfortunately, that's the way politicians tend to think, right? What is this gonna cost and what is gonna be the benefit? For every life that is lost from sudden cardiac arrest, it's equivalent to about $2.2 million from our economic productivity that we lose, right? And when you're talking about nearly 30,000 people a year dying from cardiac arrest, it's a lot of people. So we have gotta try and save more lives. I can see how passionate you are about this, Greg. Yeah, look, I, I, obviously, there's a, a reason why, right? 
and unfortunately, until your life is affected by something and you don't know about it up until that point, when you're enlightened about it, you think everybody needs to know this because the more people that know and understand about it, the more lives we're going to save. And that's what we can do together because we're sharing the message. Wow, how lucky is a yellow wiggle, Greg? As we've just seen, Dr Nick, heart attacks can strike anyone at any time. Yeah, and the fact that both a nurse who knew CPR and a defibrillator were on hand is the reason that Greg survived. Because when you're having a heart attack, time is the most critical thing. And defibrillators are so important, Dr Nick, but interestingly, only 51% of us know how to use one, Joe. Yeah, and info from St John's Ambulance in Victoria says that a lot of it has to do with confidence. And, you know, I've done that CPR training. Yeah. There couldn't be anything easier than using a defib, but it comes down, Dr Nick, to that CPR training, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, because they can look pretty intimidating, but after training, people will have the confidence to use them. And can I just say, it's about time that every single state had these as a mandatory thing in every workplace and every public building. Yeah, I agree, Nick. And as we've just seen, fast treatment is the key to saving people who are suffering from heart attacks. But maybe better than that in the first place is prevention. Starting with diet, let's check in with a leading cardiologist. Fascinated to be here at the Epworth in Richmond with cardiologist Dr Udy, who spends his life helping people to keep their heart healthy. And I think a lot of us are curious, Dr Udy, around what you do to keep your own heart healthy. You're up for some rapid-fire questions this morning? Mate, let's do it. Well, I'll start with what does a cardiologist eat? Mate, I've been uh, trying to uh, slim down and uh, eating uh, coffee for breakfast and then not having anything until after, well after lunch and pretty much... Uh, Lean meats is the key, Mediterranean diets. Is that what all cardiologists are recommending? Well, th th that's what the data tells us. It's going to make us live longer without heart attacks and strokes. If you stick to lean meats, chicken, fish, great amount of vegetables, olive oil, you're going to be around for a long time. Much better than this guy. Yeah, that's a bit unnerving, actually. I walked in and said yeah. we actually had lost someone today, yeah. Matthias, <laughs> but that is, uh, in fact, a dummy, so we're reassured by that. So what's your favourite food? When I'm... I'm Argentinian, I'm going to tell you this, right? And there's this little mate. It's like a beautiful herbal tea that I get stuck into. Okay. And um, I think that really gets me going. What's the one food you can't live without? Mate, without a doubt, I think fish is the most beautiful thing. And what's your go-to snack? Ferbera Rocher. That's, <laughs> that's the worst thing that you can have. <laughs> so, so once every couple of months, you get stuck into those. Well, it's nice for us to hear that, that's that even the cardiologist can have a, uh, a bit of chocolate. Fresh food or frozen? Oh, You've got to have fresh, right? Grilled, baked or fried? Grilled every time. What's scarier, salt or sugar? <sighs> That's a tough question. You should have said uh, fats or sugars. Then I would have told you sugar all the time. But look, look, I, I think sugars is what we know is um, has so many poor implications. You know, so if you get insulin resistance, you become overweight, you have heart disease, fatty liver disease, you know, early onset dementia. So I, I think sugars is where we're at. And we know that that's our enemy and that's what we need to target. Does oral hygiene affect your heart health? Look, oral, oral hygiene is so important because we carry so much bacteria in our mouth. And uh, if we don't look after that, you can get bacteria that gets transiently moved to the rest of the body and it can lodge in places like the heart and then you've got infections of your valves and, and which could be quite catastrophic. And that's just one small example. Um, how many hours sleep do you get? Yeah, probably not enough. I think uh, six hours is... Uh, is uh, what I'm doing at the moment. Do you take the stairs or the lift? Oh, mate, uh, look, I do take the lifts uh, occasionally just for the banter. There's always people around, but uh, you should definitely take the stairs. And how much of a role does stress play in heart health? It's huge. It's huge. I think it's important, uh, you know, your psychological well-being and, and you get managing stress appropriately because that can lead to increasing cortisol levels, you know, and have all kinds of implications from heart uh, cardiovascular health. What are the top three things we should do for heart health? What beats everything else is actually exercise. So if you can get out and about and exercise to a capacity where you're really panting, you're going to do really well. Keep to a, a good overall diet, a good theme, and then keep your body weight uh, in check. You'll, uh, you'll outlive most of us. And what's the top three cardiac screening tests we should all do? Look, but I think you need to have your cardiovascular risk factors checked because you don't feel anything if you've got high blood pressure or high cholesterol. From my point of view, you need to have a um, calcium score, you know, if you're 45 or 50 and you've got some risk factors and that will really individualise what your risk over the next 10 years is going to be like. What's the most fascinating fact about the heart? Can you believe that there's something that keeps beating 60 to 100 times a minute? 
for 80, 85 years and hardly ever wears out. You know, that, that, that is what's crazy. It's just such, such a beautiful organ that keeps us going and, you know, literally gives us life. You know, and I think when you actually think about that, you know, we've tried to replicate, you know, new valves that can be put in and everything, but everything wears out within a period of time. But this heart just keeps going and going and going. Can't buy many products that go for 90 years, don't they? Don't 100%. Know, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's what's crazy. And, and the failure rate is so really small. So it's a... Great to meet you today. I think um, I leave a lot more informed. Appreciate you joining us today. Oh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cardiologist Dr Matthias Udi there in the hot seat. And even the pros go off script sometimes. Up next, Luke Hines hits the garden for a spot of weed dating. And what do your bowel habits have to do with your heart? That's coming up. Hey, Joe, I think most of us are now familiar with the term hangry. I'm going to put my hand up. I get a little testy when I'm hungry. Oh, my gosh, you have not seen hangry until you see my 14-year-old when I am late putting dinner on the table. Like an actual change in personality. <laughs> oh, I love it. I've seen that tantrum before <laughs> on the home front. Well, that term's been validated because researchers in London have identified that the hunger hormone is genuinely linked to the part of our brain that regulates our emotion. On the flip side, being backed up and bloated is an instant recipe for feeling low. I think you would agree, Das. But who would have thought that constipation is connected to so much more than our mood? Here's Dr Nick. Unless you just turn on the television for the first time since the 1960s, you'll be aware of the dangers of things like cholesterol and smoking. But there seem to be a whole host of risk factors for heart disease, many of which we don't fully understand. For instance, a recent major study from 17 countries showed that poor grip strength was as strongly associated with the risk of dying from heart disease as high blood pressure. So, if you're finding your handshake getting a little floppy, or you're having trouble opening that jar of pickles, then get down to your GP. Oh and perhaps a gym. Predictably, things like stress and anxiety are associated with heart disease, but perhaps more surprisingly, some of things like being below average height, have increases in your earlobes, or even living near noisy roads. One particularly fascinating link was found just last year in Melbourne, when researchers at La Trobe Uni found that patients who were in hospital who had constipation were more likely to die of a heart attack. The theory goes that the longer the poo stays in the bowel, the more water is absorbed, increasing blood volume and so blood pressure. <laughs> As if being constipated wasn't bad enough. Seems to me there's no end to the list of risks of heart disease. But if you ask me, the best advice is eat well, keep active and stay off the smokes. And don't overthink it. I mean, that's a risk factor in itself. lucky enough to start the summer break with a visit to the French town of La roche Passay, which is famous for its healing thermal waters. The absolute highlight was seeing in the hospital and the amazing work and treatments that they do there. And I'll take you inside for a peek. The French town of La roche Passay is more than just a picture postcard. For centuries, people have been coming here to bathe in the thermal water, which is known for its unique soothing properties. It began life as a military hospital in the 1850s, with soldiers coming here to recover from their injuries. But nowadays, more than 700 people are treated here every single day for a variety of conditions. They include eczema, psoriasis, burns, and those undergoing cancer treatment. In fact, the French government actually subsidises treatments here to help patients recover from their illness. People have been coming to the famous thermal spa and mineral waters for over five centuries, and this is no small setup. There's over 20 hectares of thermal park with baths, a massive spa, and workshops for all kinds of health therapies. And it's all built around the healing properties associated with the thermal springs. The thermal water comes from 80 metres below the ground and contains minerals such as calcium and silicate. But the hero ingredient is selenium, a trace element that's believed to have remarkable antioxidant properties that relieve the effects of all kinds of skin conditions, even burns. 
So this treatment is for everybody, uh, eczema, psoriasis, uh, several burns, and November, a big month for several burns. From facial sprays, water massages, aero gas bars, and hydrojet showers, there's everything to treat muscle and joint pain, ulcers, acne, scarring, even gum and mouth disorders. Whatever the issue, a team of dermatologists, physios, dietitians, sports medics and therapists of all descriptions have it covered. But at the heart of the expertise is the unique therapeutic water. And yes, you can drink it. How much do you consume? Well, that all depends on what the doctor orders. Despite being more connected than ever through technology, loneliness is on the rise. It can be hard to meet new people and make meaningful connections in the digital age. Which is why there's a move to ditch the dating apps altogether and go old school face to face. I hit a community garden in Melbourne to dig the dirt on a new trend that aims to make love bloom. I'd ask, but it's awkward for me. I can't claim we dating sadly, I didn't come up with it. It came from a young farmers collective in the States who found that young people working on farms are often in small, you know, out in the country, maybe a bit isolated, they're not getting to meet people and date in the way that people living in cities might. So they set them up for young people who actually worked on farms. And then someone from Ceres at some point saw video, saw something online and thought that that was a really cool concept. I wouldn't have thought that weeding is something that people necessarily look forward to. Do you find people enjoy actually the act of doing it? Yeah, like I, um, as someone like who works outside and who works in gardens, it's not my favourite job. Um, something like harvesting or planting is a lot more fun. But I think that people find the weeding, you don't have to think too hard, hopefully, so most of your mental space is free to be talking to the person, but it's still that task and that physical thing, and it's still satisfying. I think that people like it because it's something different. Uh, you're doing something. A lot of people, I know I find it intimidating if you're going on like a date, you know, from an app or something, you've never met them, you have to just sit there and make eye contact with this new person and you're not doing something. I think people find it a lot easier to do something with their hands, there's something to talk about, and most of the people hopefully have some interest in gardening or the environment or sustainability. I've also had lots of people say it's really nice to have a dating event that's not based around alcohol. <laughs> um, yeah, it's something different. I kind of see what the vibe of the group is. If they seem chatty, I just say five minutes start now. If people seem a little bit shy, I might give them a prompt question. After five minutes, ring a little bell or tap a glass or something, and then I just rotate them around. Why do you think there's a need for this type of dating? I think that people find, well, I know lots of people say that they find dating apps quite impersonal. It's built into them that, that they're shallow kind of from the start because you're mainly doing it off what someone looks like. You don't get how that person acts, how they interact, like what the vibe is between you. So I think people find it like a more genuine, low pressure way of meeting people and definitely that feeling that maybe that person will have something in common. What happens at the end though? Like how do people swap details? Once we're out of time, I let people know if they're feeling brave, Obviously they can approach anyone at that point, ask people for their number, etc. They might stick around for a coffee, so we've got the little coffee cart. Um, but if people are feeling shy, we have a little form um, where you match up. So people write down their own name and number and anyone that they would like to be put in touch with. Um, and if that person's also written them down, they've matched. So the same way you might match on like a traditional dating app. Um, and then I send them a little text saying, so-and-so has also written you down, here's their number, and then it's all up to them what happens from there. And are you sure this isn't a trick to get free labour at Joe's? I can make no guarantee. <laughs> I'm trying, trying to get back.
Jack, how special was your visit to oh. the French town of La roche posay oh, You say that better than I, I do. I love it. Um, it was amazing. And what's particularly special about this town is the water. People come from all over the world to seek treatment here. And the water is full of these minerals and it's been scientifically tested for its therapeutic properties with some amazing results. And I tell you what, the water there is just so soft. That's what you notice. Um, but we're very lucky living here in Melbourne too, aren't we? Because we've got some amazing springs. Oh, Jack, who doesn't love a day soaking in Dalesford mm. or the peninsula? <laughs> and both will feature in the new 900-kilometre Great Victorian Bathing Trail Ooh. just announced here in Victoria. Sounds fabulous. So there are similar trails in Colorado, in Switzerland and in New Zealand. And the idea is, you know, you do your bathing, then you go do some yoga, maybe a hike, and you finish off with some of the beautiful local food because who doesn't need a decent meal after all that hard work? Jack? Oh, absolutely. The icing on the cake is the great food mm. and no doubt out, wellness holidays are the big trend for 2024. But here's a tip if you are bathing in the beautiful outdoors, don't forget the sunscreen. SPF cocktailing is taking a little bit of your sunscreen and mixing it in the palm of your hand with your foundation or other cosmetic products, then applying it to the skin. Many people choose SPF cocktailing because they want to avoid the ghosting effect of sunscreen, which means that white cast that's left on the face. The problem with SPF cocktailing is you never know quite how much of true SPF protection you're getting. We also know that chemical sunscreens can be somewhat unstable and when combined with other chemicals may actually degrade, not providing any SPF protection at all. In Australia, we have an extremely high UV index for many months of the year. Most cosmetic products will offer a degree of sun protection, but it's impossible to know just how much and which wavelengths of light that particular product is protecting against. For example, one moisturiser or one cosmetic product may protect really well against ultraviolet B, but not actually contain any UVA coverage. So we generally recommend using both a good quality sunscreen as well as a cosmetic product if you're looking for the best sun protection. As tasty as it might sound, SPF cocktailing is not something I recommend to my patients. We're really lucky in Australia to have a range of excellent sunscreens that are lightweight, broad spectrum and are barely visible. A familiar feeling after eating is a full tummy or a belly that gurgles and rumbles as it digests. Either way, it's satisfaction. But any discomfort in our gut may instead leave us unable to wear what we want to wear, eat what we want to eat, and in some cases, we can't even leave the house. Unfortunately, unpleasant gut symptoms are common, with at least 50% of Australian adults experiencing abdominal bloating, flatulence, and constipation. A number of lifestyle choices may be to blame. A high salt diet and even eating too quickly can increase the amount of gas in our digestive system. But even if we pay close attention to what and how we eat, unpleasant gut symptoms may still occur. Peppermint and ginger are traditionally used in Western herbal medicine to relieve and help reduce the occurrence of uncomfortable abdominal bloating. They also assist in relieving the symptoms of indigestion, such as nausea and painful wind. There's also sweet orange used in traditional Western herbal medicine to stimulate gastric secretions, which may aid digestion. Luckily, these ingredients can be found in supplement form. For a healthy digestive system, look for one with the addition of digestive enzymes. They help support the breakdown and digestion of fats, carbohydrates, sugars, protein, and lactose, turning them into nutrients the body can use. If unpleasant gut symptoms persist, check in with your healthcare professional so that nothing can stop you from exploring the wide world of food with family and friends. Now, Darcy, I don't want to sound like a cyber stalker, but it has been brought to my attention that you are ageing particularly well. In actual fact, your look has not changed for 20 years. Have a look at these footy posters. Well, that may be the kindest thing you've ever said to me, Joe. I'm not <laughs> sure it's true, although my kids always say to me, Dad, you've had the same haircut 
for your entire life. Any danger, you could change it up. So, no, nah, I'm pretty consistent, You're Joe. You're a winner. Why would you change it? <laughs> exactly. Whereas I have pretty much explored every look I could possibly have, and I think you'll agree, never a fail, obviously. <laughs> oh, there was that time when my hair fell out, but apart from that... <laughs> Nailed every single one of those looks, Joe, and still looking sensational today, of course. Now, without being too judgmental, Joe, because it's not my area of expertise, I must admit I struggled with the sort of big lips and the massive big fake eyelashes trend going on. And is that going to continue or not? Well, you know, the word on the street is that we're looking for a minimalist look in 2024. Beauty this year is all about pairing it back. And here's makeup artist Jade Kisnorbo with how to let your natural beauty shine through. It's 2024, can't believe I'm even saying that, but 23 was all about strawberry makeup, latte makeup. This year, I think it's going to continue with that fresh face, natural skin, freckles, which I love, but I think having a little more fun with eyeliner and just really bringing back the 90s and a little bit of a 60s influence also. Right now, the trend that I would say I'm loving the most would have to be the ballet core. So think of those beautiful sleek buns, fresh skin. It's my favourite. There's so many makeup trends, but the one that always gets my eye every time, it's the eyeliner trends. We've seen smudgy liner, we've seen liquid liner, brown liner, so many different liners. But the main one for 2024 is going to be say goodbye to your boring liners. Think of floating liners, graphic liners. Liner options now are limitless. Brooke, tell me, how is your liner game? Not great. <laughs> There's so many people out there, they freak out when it comes to applying liquid liner. You're one of those girls? Definitely. <laughs> Always the hardest job for makeup. It is. It is a hard job until I teach you some little tricks. You're going to just apply it really easily. The first tip, don't turn your eye to one side or angle your face. It's really important to look straight in the mirror and then make this pencil or liner, liquid liner, do the work for you. First, I like to apply the liner almost like a stamp. Hold it in an angle like this and stamp it following the bottom of the eye, okay? The heavier you go, the thicker the line. After you've done this, turn the pen around and connect the whole lash line to the outer corner of the eye. To finish this off, go in where the tear duct is and line the waterline. Okay guys, I've given you all the makeup trends. I've told you how to apply the liner, what direction. All I can say now is have a steady hand and good luck. journey through life's ups and downs, it's inevitable that the human body will change, particularly if you're a woman. A healthy weight looks different for everyone, but there may be times where weight management needs to be considered for our broader health. Excess weight, especially obesity, may diminish multiple aspects of the body and mind, impacting cardiovascular health, reproductive health, respiratory function, and even memory and mood. When it comes to weight loss, sadly, there is no magical solution that provides overnight results. Step one is speaking to a qualified health professional who knows your personal health history. Generally speaking though, a healthy diet and regular exercise is key to weight management. Crash dieting is the ultimate no-no as it lowers your metabolic rate, putting you at a higher risk of gaining more weight in the long run. The best likelihood of success? Slow, small, achievable changes to your lifestyle. Meal replacements for weight control may also be a good option. They work by reducing calorie intake while preserving lean muscle mass and may contribute to overall health as they're jam-packed full of vitamins and minerals. If you are a woman, it's important to look for one that is especially formulated for a woman's needs with collagen and 20 grams of protein. It should also be clinically proven to help reduce hunger, lower cravings and assist with improving gut health. The number on your clothing should not define who you are. It's all about focusing on how you feel and your ability to do the things you love every day. Jo, 
it was a little while ago now, but we haven't stopped talking about the FIFA Women's World Cup. And why would we? Because it was just so awesome. (laughs) Absolutely. It was one for the history books, absolutely, Jack. And while it has seen many girls tuning into the sport of soccer, it has also meant more creation of new tech for the sport as well. And Adidas has just helped create a new high-tech ball that can send real-time data back to the referees. That's right. The ball is actually called Fußball Liebe, which means nice. love of football <laughs> in German. And it is the official match ball for Euro 2024, which is amazing. And it's got little sensors all over it, which records the exact moment the ball is kicked, which will hopefully mean for referees, their decisions are quicker and more accurate, which is obviously good for the game. Well, lots of kids are playing summer sport, which of course brings with it bumps and scrapes, as well as sweat-induced itches and scratches, which is something the doctors are tackling with some salvation for the skin. Hi, and welcome to Medicine, Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr Nick, and I'm the past. And my name's Dr Isabel, and I'm the future. And together, we're we're the present. present. (laughs) Dr Isabel, I want to play a game with you today. I call it Rash Roulette. (laughs) Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Uh, I'm not quite sure it's my idea of fun, (laughs) Dr Nick. Come on, don't be such a curmudgeon. That's my job. (laughs) Look, I want to give you descriptions of three different rashes, and you've got to work out what they are. Well, it kind of does sound like fun, actually. All right, let's do it. <laughs> OK, number one. I'm red, I'm scaly, I'm itchy and scratchy, I'm in the elbows, I'm behind the knees, and I'm affected by the weather. What am I? So, elbows and knees itchy and scaly. It's got to be eczema, right? Ding, ding! Yes, eczema. Um, one of the commonest rashes that we get, about 30% of the Australian population will get it, and it often goes with asthma or hay fever. <laughs> but, Dr Isabel, what actually is eczema? So, like you said, it's a common dermatitis. Now, Dr Nick, there's a clue in that name. Yes, because in medicine, anything which ends with itis means inflammation. So we have, for example, sinusitis, tonsillitis, appendicitis. So dermatitis just means inflammation of the skin. Yeah, and it tends to run in families. So if your parents have it or your siblings have it, you might also have it. Now, there's no cure for eczema, so some children will grow out of it, but a lot will have to manage it their whole life. And because there's no cure, then treatment becomes very important, and particularly for what we call eczema flares. So, Dr Isabel, what is the treatment? Ah, so it's a moisturiser. Morning and night, just lather it on. And if the moisturiser's not really helping, see your GP for some prescription ointments and creams. Okay, Dr well, I've got number two for you. OK, I've got a four-year-old. They've got a temperature. They've got spots on the hands, on the feet. Don't want to drink or eat anything. Feeling pretty miserable. What disease have they got? Oh, so hands and feet. It's got to be hand, foot and mouth disease, Dr Nick. Correct, Dr Isabel. And I'm guessing that if you open that child's mouth, they wouldn't want to eat or drink anything because they've got nasty sore spots inside their mouth as well. And that's exactly right. And then what antibiotic would we give them to treat it? Well, that's a trick question, Dr Nick. You don't need antibiotics for hand, foot and mouth disease because it's a virus. All they need is plenty of rest, simple fluids, things like icy poles to help with the sores in the mouth. I've got one for you now. My turn. Same child as before, four-year-old. This time they've had a fever a couple of days ago and instead of blisters on their hands and feet, they've got blisters all over their body. And what do these blisters look like? Mm, So they started off quite small. They've gotten a little bit bigger and filled with fluid. Now some of them have popped and crusted over. What do you think? Yeah, I think I know this one because that sounds like chicken pox. And just like hand, foot and mouth, it's due to a virus, so you don't really need treatment unless you're really tiny and sick. And before vaccination, that child might have been invited to what was called a pox party. A what? A pox party. Uh, A pox party? Yeah, yeah, just saying the name over and over again doesn't help me understand it, Dr Nick. What's a pox party? (laughs) So people used to invite the child who had chicken pox to mingle with all the others so they could all get the disease, get it over and done with and become immune into adulthood (laughs) because the fluid in those blisters was so infectious. Oh, that's so gross, Dr Nick. And sometimes they'd even get a lollipop that that pox-affected child was sucking and they'd pass it around... I get the gist. Thank you very much. Thankfully, these days, we've got really effective vaccines, so no need for pox-flavoured lollipops. You know what gets my heart pumping? The anticipation of a mouth-watering, tantalising meal, like my banana-leaf steamed snapper with zesty broccolini. 
Snapper has a delicate, sweet taste that goes perfectly with a mix of flavours and textures. Soy sauce, sesame oil, ginger. And don't forget my favourite, chilli, for that hint of heat. I love Snapper for its taste, but all fish is full of omega-3 fatty acids and protein. After you've popped each piece of Snapper in the centre of the banana leaf, secure with a skewer or anything you have handy. I'm leaving the fish to steam for about 10 minutes while I add the broccolini to the pan. Make sure the pan is very hot. It's that smoky, slightly charred flavour I'm looking for that'll complement the soft textures of the fish. Plus, broccolini is high in antioxidants and lots of nutrients. More goodness for your heart. And my secret to keeping the greens fun for the taste buds, drizzle with a little lime juice and sprinkle with sesame seeds. It will give that subtle nutty crunch with a tinge of zest. No salt required. Now that will keep your heart happy. Amazing. We started off today talking about Red Feb, so let's finish with how we can keep our heart ticking over, mainly with weight and exercise. Cardiologists will tell us that the heart neck is effectively a pump, and as a muscle, the more we use it, the stronger it gets. Avoid ultra-processed foods, eat a balanced diet of fish and veggies mm. and fruit, and add meat if you like it, but lay off the salt shaker, Darth. <laughs> well, you'll be pleased to know that a glass of red wine is OK, but just don't have two or three, because then the positive effects disappear. And finally, ditch the smokes, no matter what age you are. And if you're over 40, then get your cholesterol, your blood pressure and sugar checked, and don't ignore the warning signs. So if you get chest pain or some funny arm pain, or palpitations, it's call triple zero, get down to the emergency room. So all about being aware, Nick, and taking action if required. And on that note, what a great start to a healthy 2024 here on the House of Wellness. Yes, uh, House of Wellness Radio is back as well with Gerald Quigley and Luke Hines every Sunday. So nice to be with you, Joe, Jack and Dr Nick Carr. Great to have our friends at Chemist Warehouse on board. We look forward to a big year of wellness here on the House of Wellness.